Thank you. <laughs> so I'm Dan Garcia. I teach computer science at UC Berkeley. Go Bears! Yeah. Woo! So I'm going to talk about sharing the beauty and joy of computing with everybody. Computing has transformed our society from the laptops that we use to work and play to the smart devices that we have to medicine and surgeries to our homes and the Internet of Things to our communications, GPS, entertainment, animation industries to disrupting transportation, even self-driving cars and even contact lenses that measure your blood glucose levels. So computing affects everyone and every field. We need everybody fluent in computing and technology. So they're not just passive users of it, but active creators of it. We need everyone, not just computer scientists, but farmers, doctors, lawyers, politicians, especially politicians, everybody to know how computing works. I'm a computer science educator. I'm passionate about sharing this with as many people as I can. So let me start at the beginning for me. I grew up in New York City in the Bronx, one of the five boroughs of New York. It's a working class, extremely diverse community, but there's always a kind of a chip on the shoulder. So when, you ask, when someone asks you where you're from, you have to say, yo, I'm from the Bronx. You've got a problem with that. <laughs> with the, with the, the hands, you see, the hands is the key to that. So I moved from the Bronx to upstate New York, Cooperstown. That's the home of the Baseball Hall of Fame. How many of you have been to the Baseball Hall of Fame? All right, a couple of you. How, how do you get there? Kind of drive and work on your hitting. See, it's the practice. Okay. When I was at Cooperstown, I was really lucky to have what I believe to be the greatest teacher I ever had, Mr. White. He was my math teacher. And he had had no formal training in computing. But what he did was he found the wherewithal to get a lab full of computers. He taught himself computer science. And he offered a computer science course. So I was taking all these math courses, doing well. I loved it. And all of a sudden, I took this computer science course, and it changed my life. I realized, A, I wanted to be like Mr. White and be a teacher, but I also want to do this stuff. This was amazing. So that was incredible. And here I am. I go to college. I end up at Berkeley, and I, I think back and I say, well, sure, everybody, that was 30 years ago. I'm sure everyone has computer science in their high schools by now, right? Right? You think, come on, everybody has computer science. 30 years ago, I had it. Most everybody has it, right? Yeah, not so much. <laughs> this is a graph showing the high school advanced placement enrollment in different courses. And you can see on the bottom, the big number is history. There's English and science. There are about a million each. And way down, way down on the long tail is computer science. This is a couple years ago. And what's worse is not just, it's about 20, 25,000 students taking, compared to a million people taking history. Okay? And you say, well, okay, well, maybe, you know, people don't want it. Now remember, computer science in high school is usually for majors. People who are intending to major in computer science in college are taking that course and moving on. Part of the problem is, they don't look like the rest of the country. So only 15% of those 25,000 were young women, and only 8% are people of color. So something's wrong there, that it's certainly not the case that everyone's getting access to it. It's not the case, well, it's at every high school and just people don't want to do it. No, it's not the case at all. It's mostly at rich suburban high schools. It's not in the inner city for the most part. So this is really an equity issue of trying to get computer science to everybody. So, we all realize that computer science and computing in general is the literacy of the 21st century. But, at the same time, this course that's supposed to introduce people to it is only available in 5% of the schools. And the problem is, you have a five times more likely chance of having high school football than a computer science course. That's crazy. So the consensus is, what do we fix this? We've got to fix it somewhere in the, in the K-12 pipeline. Well, the consensus is to start in the high school. Jan Cooney, one of the leaders in the broadening participation in the computing movement, she's an NSF program officer, she says, you know, 
They told me not to go into high schools, but high school is where it's at because if you do something amazing in middle school, nah, 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 and then have nothing in high school, it just drops out. And if you decide to wait to college, well, people are already making the decision of what their major is going to be before they get to college, so they, didn't want, they, don't, they won't even walk into the class. You might have the most amazing, awesome class. Come on, everybody, computer science, hey, where'd they go? And there's nobody there. Because they've decided before they got there that they were going to major in something else. So you got to go to high school. Jane Margolis, who is one of the amazing sociologists at UCLA, she looked at the Los Angeles Unified School District and she found dysfunction at all levels, at high-performing schools and rich schools and not so high-performing schools and underserved schools. And she said, we need, to fix, we need to fix this. So she created a new course called Exploring Computer Science and they're trying to pass it around the country and they're doing a great job of it. So how you make fundamental institutional change across the states, it's really hard. You're fighting 50 different fights. But one way to have a single source of national leverage is to go with the advanced placement group with the college board because they're everywhere. So we sat back. There was a conference in 2008 where we said, we are many educators in Chicago, we said, let's create a new course. Let's call it a computer science principles and let's introduce that course to everybody. Let's have it not just be the new course for majors, but let's have it a non-majors course. So you take a course in high school that would be the equivalent of a non-majors university course. Rigorous, outstanding, engaging, and affecting everybody. So we're really excited about that. And I'm delighted to say that I'm serving on the development committee for the CS principals team, and we're helping to bring the exam together that's going to go live fall of 2016, spring of 2017. So what is CS principals? The foundation is two pieces. So it's founded on the idea of seven big ideas, seven really powerful ideas in computer science. From abstraction, creativity, data, programming, algorithms, how the internet works, and global impacts. It's also founded on six computational thinking practices. So that's what you do in the course. This is connecting computing to other fields, creating artifacts, actually building things, abstracting, analyzing problems and artifacts, communicating and collaborating. It's awesome. So that's the foundation. And that's just a curriculum framework. That's not telling you what to do every minute. It's saying this is in general what should be covered, kind of a syllabus, and you can then build a course around that, kind of hanging the meats to the bones of this curriculum framework. But you have to then get it to the world. So the CS10K project says computer science, 10K means 10,000, the hope is we get 10,000 teachers teaching either exploring computer science or CS principles in every high school in the country, which would be great by 2016. So that's the CS10K movement. So we came back to Berkeley, we huddled, and we said, we got to build a course that's compliant with this, that's awesome. In the meantime, let's, retake our, well, let's rethink our old non-majors course to have like this broader vision, not just programming. It was just programming before, to have this really broad, awesome vision. And so my colleague at Berkeley, Brian Harvey, and my colleague at NC State, Tiffany Barnes, we huddled together and we built the beauty and joy of computing. And you see the little logo with a smiley face to kind of capture that this course should be fun and rigorous and awesome, and you should learn a lot about very deep ideas in computer science. So what differentiates BJC from other initiatives that are also CS principles compliant is we take a little bit more of a programming-centric lens to things. When we worked with our students, they say, Dan, the most fun I had in this course is when I was building something, when I was programming and building my own project. So we said, all right, let's kind of twist it so that we have a more programming-centric focus on things. We also use a graphical language called Snap. I'll talk about that in a slide or two. And the exciting thing about that is we're not just having the same typo errors that most people have in their intro languages because you're doing a graphical drag and drop, and I'll actually show some code. We'll actually have an exercise here that'll show you what we do in our course. It makes coding easier. We talk about the unintended implications of computing technology. So we kind of think about um, balancing positive and negative issues with anything, especially unintended implications like privacy concerns. All resources are free. Most other people who are working on CS Principles curriculum also make their resources free. So that's not unique. That's not what makes BJC unique. But we try to tap into all the resources so that if you're the most underserved high school in the country, there's no reason you can't adopt this curriculum. And so we work with the Beauty and the, the Blown to Bits book, which is amazing. It's a Creative Commons book out of MIT and Harvard, and it's outstanding for talking about how transformational, transformational things are when they go digital. 
So we really stand on the shoulders of giants. One is, this curriculum framework is outstanding, and so we're standing on that shoulder and doing a really good job because we think that's really dynamic and awesome. We think the Blown to Bits book is amazing and just awesome in terms of having that be the reading for our students. And we stand on the shoulder of the Scratch team at MIT who's produced an amazing programming language for kids, and we stand on their shoulders because we have taken that and added some things that are kind of more university-friendly, recursion, the ability to create functions, and functions as data. Functions aren't just things that are separate, and data's over here. Functions can be data. They can be first class. So Jens Monig here is our lead developer, and he's amazing to make Snap worldwide and really re robust. And it's in the browser, so you can make, uh, you can use it on your smart devices, on your iPads, and you can make an actual mobile app in 90 seconds. It's pretty cool. And here's the example of showing a for loop, which is really hard to build in other languages, but easy for us. So I'm going to show you an actual exercise we do in our class to teach the idea of recursion, one of our big ideas. So there's three blocks of code up there you see. On the left is setup code. It basically has the arrowhead on the bottom right set up and pointing upwards. And its pen at its tip is down. It's kind of like a Roomba if it walked around and kind of painted its way on this red carpet. It would draw, if you taped a pen to it, it would draw a picture. That's what this sprite's going to do. Then the main program is called V. This V program is from Paul Goldenberg of EDC. I'll mention EDC in a second. And this idea is, here's what V is going to do. Here's, I'm the sprite. My hand's the sprite. It turns 45 degrees, moves out, and then picks one of the blocks from that list. Students know that's the shape of a list, so that's a list of a square, a hex, and a star. So it means I'm going to wiggle around, but because my pen is down, it means I'm going to draw a square, a hex, or a star. Then back up, turn 90 degrees, and do it again. Go out, pick from one of that list, draw it, move around, and then back up and recenter. And I start, I end at the same place I started, and that's an important piece. Let's run this together, shall we? And go. Oh, that's kind of cool. Look, it went left and drew a star, and then went right, uh, uh, went and then drew a hex, and it's really great. Okay? Let's run it again. Oh, now it drew a hex and a square. That's fine. And Paul's brilliant idea was, what if we actually added V itself to the list? Now your brain should go like, whoa. That's weird, because V might go to the end and choose V. Ah, what would happen? Okay, so let's just see. Let's run it. Let's just see what happens. Okay, ready? Go. And it, oh, it's the same thing. Oh, it's the same thing. Well, that's okay. It just decided not to choose V. Totally cool. Let's try it again. Ooh, look at that. So it went left, and it chose V again. And then it split two chose squares, two squares, and that's cool. Okay, so now let's run it one more time. It's the same program. I didn't change anything. It just reran and created that. So not only, this course is called Beauty and Joy of Computing for a Reason. Not only is some of the output, fractals and graphics, beautiful, but the code itself, in recursion, is the first time in our course where the code itself is a thing of beauty, and that's awesome. So we've taught this at Berkeley to great success. We have lots of data for 20 years of the percentage of women in our course. The bottom wiggly lines are the non-major are the major courses and they wiggle around 20 percent the top wiggly line are the non-major courses and that wiggles around 35 percent we're doing pretty well on non-major course this is the one before bjc after bjc we actually eclipsed 50 percent every other student was a woman in my class and i was so delighted with that that for the first time we actually had reached gender equity in our class and what i was so passionate about is that so many students came back and decided to give back to the course and decided to be teaching assistants to do that. And it's so inspiring for a young woman to look up to the teaching staff and see half of them uh, look, looking like them. It's just awesome. So the future of BJC is we're going with edX. We're going online. I want to have pa uh, uh, Leonard Nimoy passed away yesterday, so I want to give some honor to him. But the small private online course is, we call it a SPOC. Uh, and the idea is we give this course online to the teacher. And the teacher then has full control. They can edit it and brand it, and they can add their students to a forum, which is safe because it's only their students. It's awesome. So the teacher feels in control. And this launches, it's free, and it launches Labor Day 2015. We're also giving back to New York City. Thanks to the NSF, we're going to be granted to go and teach 100 new young high school teachers to teach this course in their schools. And New York City is one of the most diverse in all of the country. It has almost 70% students of color, so we're really excited to kind of come full circle. I started in New York, and I'm coming back to New York to give back 
to teach this course there. We're working with EDC, who's a curriculum development team, to kind of polish our stuff and make sure it's totally ready for high schools. So finally, I want to give honor to Mr. White, because tragically he passed away in 2007. But through our work and others in the CS10K movement, we hope there'll be many more Mr. Whites who will take a risk and offer computer science in their schools with the goal of broadening participation to everybody in computing. Thank you very much.